As a physiology and neurobiology major, I never expected to be able to spend my whole summer working on a film project. But when I was accepted into UConn's inaugural cohort of bold scholars, that dream was able to become a reality. My goal was to combine three of my passions, healthcare, storytelling, and feminism. This is that film. My name is Dr. Camelia Lawrence and I am a breast surgeon. Uh, typically I see patients on Mondays, uh, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays are my full operative days so I spend most of my time in the OR. Um, Fridays are usually my administrative day and then Thursdays I'm in the clinic seeing patients as well. I do have a dual responsibility in addition to being a breast surgeon, I'm also the director of breast surgery for our program in the central region of Connecticut. So I have some administrative responsibilities as well. I've had a huge support system from the beginning of my journey. It includes my immediate family, my mom and dad, um, my husband and my kids and my siblings. And along the way, I've met several friends as well as co um, colleagues who've been mentors and supporters and sponsors. So I've been very blessed in that regard. So it's a huge system support infrastructure. You know, I've always been interested in the service industry. Um, I enjoy uh, meeting new people, I enjoy working as part of a team and a former athlete. Uh, prior to entering medicine, I was actually a teacher. I often joke that I, it was eighth grade health and science. Teenagers are tough. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think I, I filled the role. I enjoyed it, but I was looking for a little bit something different. Um, perhaps uh, working with, uh, transition to working with an adult uh, population. So I, I've always wanted to uh, be a physician, um, but I also have very humble beginnings and didn't always think that this was feasible for me. So when the opportunity presents itself for me to apply to medical school, I went for it. Uh, I, you know, when I entered medical school, I, I thought I wanted to be a family practitioner, and I, but I also enjoy working with my hands. I grew up around my grandmother and my mother sewing. Um, so we've always worked with our hands. And I met a woman, Dr. Gretchen Arndt. Um, she was a breast surgeon. And at the completion of my first year of medical school, I asked her if it was okay for me to spend some time with her for that summer. And she graciously said yes. And I spent a few days with her in the office, in the operating room, and I was completely smitten. Um, the other thing that I could identify with her in some sense, that she was also a mother which is something that I wanted for myself. Um, she had three lovely girls, um, and she was balanced in the career as well as her own personal responsibilities quite well. And then to see her in action in terms of how she interacted with the patients as well as in the operating room, just being in command of her environment, and she had really great outcomes. So I think that's where I first said, you know, maybe I can, I can do this. Maybe this is possible for me. Are there any particular challenges um, that you face throughout your medical career uh, journey to get to where you are today? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I'm a woman in a male-dominated field. Uh, you know, I'm a surgeon. Uh, I'm also a woman of color. Um, and we live in a society where we all have biases, conscious and unconscious biases. Um, there's certain expectations or preconceived expectations of who you are, what your capabilities are. So I deal with those challenges um, just about on a daily basis. Um, but I, I, I try to focus on the positive. Um, I know exactly who I am. I know what I've been adequately trained. I'm confident in what I'm doing. I'm very confident with taking care of my patients. So that's what I tend to focus on. But definitely there has been insurmountable challenges along the path. I've always been a huge proponent of diversity. I think diversity of ideas and people is gonna yield 
are going to yield the best results. And in particular, as it pertains to women of color, uh, when you think about a woman of color and a surgeon, we account for less than 0.2% of the medical uh, field in the United States. So when a patient that's a woman of color comes in and they have, let's say, a breast cancer, I think in some regards, and this is not a generalized statement because not all women of color, but they may be more, more maybe they may be more able to identify with seeing somebody that looks like themselves. The other thing that we deal with is the distress in the medical system, and there are valid reasons for uh, the distrust. Um, and I, during my conversation, I'm able to help mitigate some of that distress and to um, help patients to, to see why they need to take a certain action, or why do you need to have your breast cancer surgically resected. Um, so I do make a conscious effort to connect with all my patients, but women of color and those who are not. Um, but you know, as it pertains to women of color in particular, you know, they sometimes they walk in a room and their eyes lit up. They're like, "Oh, I didn't expect it that you know it would be a surgeon, a woman of color, as well." My name is Cynthia D'Alessandro Silva and I'm the Division Head of Nephrology at Connecticut Children's. I think most people don't understand what kidney diseases are. They haven't heard about it, they're not educated on it, and these children become very sick very quickly or suffer from chronic conditions. And so being there to support children and families through that, educating them, getting to know the family, becoming part of a family to them, um, having this be their medical home and a very safe space for them is really helpful. Because these children have chronic diseases, you typically get to see them grow through life. And so to be there with them through their development um, and supporting them is very gratifying. I like thinking of new ways and being involved in kind of pushing the advances of, of the care that we deliver to these children. What are some of your hobbies or things you do to relax? Hobbies? Okay, this is so embarrassing. I started coloring. Because I'm such a type A and I want to stay in the lines and I want it to look so good, it forces you just to think about the coloring the whole time and so I can't really stress about other things while I'm coloring. Um, but I try not to tell a lot of people that I color. How do you think being trilingual helps you to provide patient care? I think it gives you that street credit. So even though my accent is probably horrible, um, we want our patients and our families to trust us. And so when you don't look like your patient, um, or you don't look like the family that they're used to, gaining that trust is very difficult. When you understand the culture to the point where the family sees that you're trying to speak their language, even if you're not doing the best job, they that, that engenders a, a bit of trust there so that you can have therapeutic connection with them to help them understand why you're asking them to do this hard thing or why the medication is important or, or why the things that they really don't understand is really gonna help them. So I found it helpful in that way. The million dollar question, why did you want to become a physician? Oh, yeah, so probably cheesy and typical. Um, so the truth is in college I wanted to be a veterinarian and they told me I wasn't smart enough to be a veterinarian and to just stick to people. So that's how that began. I, I like to be in charge. I like to know everything about everything. I like to know the exact reason drilled down to why it works this way, why it does that, which is why I think I really enjoy physiology. For us, it was really, do you want to be a nurse or do you want to be a physician? And I think I enjoyed the aspect of creating the care plan diagnosing, figuring out what's wrong. Um, and so that, that was something that spoke to me at that time. I, I never doubted that becoming a physician was the right path for me, but I frequently and have frequently doubted my abilities as a physician. I think there's a lot of data on imposter syndrome. Um, and I think any 
woman in particular who is successful starts to doubt, are they able to do what they're doing? Are they good enough? Did, was it just some accident? Did the sun, this moon, and the stars align and I just slip by, you know, the application committee and they weren't paying attention? Well, every time I wrote my personal statement um, and then went on interviews, I just tried to be as painfully honest, um, even if it was painful for myself. Um, there's this woman now, Brene Brown, and she talks about the power of vulnerability. And so just to kind of bear it all and be who I am and talk about what I'm looking for helped weed certain places out because they weren't looking for me. But at the same time, every interview, you're interviewing them as well. Where are you going to fit? You know, what are your values? What is your... Uh, what's at the heart of what you want to do and so um, in retrospect I always ended up where I was meant to be. Hi, I'm Dr. Leah Derrick. I am an obstetrician gynecologist and I'm in private practice working mostly out of Bridgeport, Connecticut and surrounding towns and my hospital work is done at St. Vincent's Medical Center. The whole reproductive process and the fact that a person grows inside of a woman and then, you know, after nine months a, a human being comes out. I just, oh, I was always in awe of that. I thought that that was so amazing. Um, and then as I learned more about obstetrics and gynecology, I realized that there's really a lot of elements to this field that are very different from others. And, and when I say that, I mean we're surgeons. Um, we also provide, in a sense, primary care, though we don't necessarily consider ourselves primary care physicians, as do pediatricians, family practitioners, or family practitioners, or internal medicine specialists. Um, we do provide well care across the reproductive lifespan. Two days ago, I saw a patient who I hadn't seen in 22 years because I delivered one of her babies, but she wasn't my patient in the group. She is the patient of one of my partners, but her daughter now needed to be seen, and she brought her to me. And I hadn't seen this woman in 22 years. I knew who she was right away, and that's rewarding. You know, her for whatever reason, her daughter preferred not to see a male physician who is, you know, the doctor of mom, and she wanted to see a, a lady doctor, and this woman said, well, I knew her from 22 years ago, and she delivered you, and I'm going to bring you to see her, and that that's just great. I mean, I, I love that. I love catching up with patients. I met a patient the other day who I hadn't seen in years, and she said, we were pregnant at the same time. She said, you must have a 20-year-old. I said, yeah. She goes, because you delivered my baby, and you were pregnant, ready to deliver your baby soon. So, I mean, that's just fun, I, you know, and you catch up and patients I've seen over the years, every year we catch up and we went through uh, potty training conversations, choosing preschool, um, driver's ed, looking for colleges, you know, it's just going through life and just feeling like you're, you're just a mo another mom. You know, I think that's a really fun thing. And I don't think you get that relationship with patients if you work in an emergency room or you work in an urgent care, which is fine because that's not what you're looking for if you choose that field. I wouldn't be happy there. I like walking into a room and seeing a patient that I've seen every year for the past 22 years, um, saw her through her pregnancies, maybe delivered some babies, maybe did a hysterectomy when she needed surgery. You know, I've been there in her life in various ways for 22 years. And that's the part of this that I love. So that's a nice part of the, pra the practice is the relationships that you build and you take care of patients, you know, in wellness and in sickness. And, um, you know, you can, yes, treat chronic conditions, you know, that linger through, through the woman's lifetime but also you know, she can come in with a short-term problem that you can either treat medically or surgically and within a few days or a week, she's better, so that's nice. And then, you know, the surgical component, you know, to, if you are hands-on and enjoy, you know, the, that technical part of medicine, we get to do that as well. So it's a, very, it's a broad um, specialty. And then even within the field, you can narrow it down to just high-risk obstetrics, just infertility. 
um, cancer treatment within gynecology, so which I have not chosen to do. I'm in general practice. Um, but there's really a lot of choices within this field. Um, but I think going back, um, the, the thing that drew me to it the most was the, the obstetrics part, which ironically is the part that creates the biggest challenge with the schedule because that's the part that happens in the middle of the night most of the time. You know, I don't love what I do every minute of every day. There's challenges. Um, and they're, you know, at three o'clock in the morning, when I had to start a C-section this morning. Man, there's gotta be a better way to make a living. Truly, and then you, that you think that, I'm only human. I was tired, I had just worked from eight o'clock in the morning, it's now three o'clock the next day. Um, but when that little baby came out, and you hear that baby cry for the first time, it didn't matter that it was three o'clock in the morning. You know, I could have chosen a lot of other fields with a better work schedule and maybe lifestyle, but I don't think I would have been happy. So you have to put up with the bad to get, get the good, I guess. And I just read a statistic that said that recently for the first time, a medical school um, starting med, med students, first year med students now, more than 50% are women. So a very gradual shift and it's, it changes in different specialties and I think that it's great to see more female representation um, but we have to make sure that there's adequate support peer support mentoring support for those women in fields that aren't traditionally female because it might seem a little lonely and isolated to not have people that could have your back and and to teach you and help you see it's all possible I had mentors that showed me what worked for them and I could learn from them and learn from their experience and if you don't have that I think it's harder so I'd like to see more women in all the fields of medicine so that there's not any one specialty that any woman couldn't feel as open to her um, I didn't face that but I hope that there aren't people saying I'm not going to choose X, Y, or Z because there's not that many women that do that. So my name is Nita Huja um, and I am a cancer surgeon and also currently the chair of the Department of Surgery at Yale University um, and chief of Yale New Haven Health system. As chair of a department of surgery, we have roughly about a thousand um, faculty members, um, residents, medical students, and staff. So majority of my time, unfortunately, has now changed from being in the operating room to being an administrator and managing the finances of the department, ensuring our medical education or surgical education runs well, our faculty are doing well. Um, but I still operate. I am a, uh, as I mentioned, a surgical oncologist. So most of my patients will come to me for um, gastric cancers, pancreatic cancers, or um, comp anything that's more complex. And alongside, I've always had a laboratory. I have a bench, a laboratory where it studies molecular biology of cancers. I often say, you know, it takes a village. Um, so, um, and I have a village, so um, I have two children. Uh, who are now teenagers, two boys, and I had my first one in residency, and this is um, currently surgical residency now has an 80-hour limitation in a work week, and, but this is when I finished, and before that there was no restriction. So you kind of spent, residency means a resident, and it comes from the Hopkins word, because residents lived in the hospital. So I lived in the hospital for most of my surgical training. And of course, you um, also, um, at some point, I got married. And we've always learned to figure things out together. Uh, my mom um, moved in. It's funny, when um, Obama moved in into office, they brought their grandmother. We had done that a long time before that, and we, my kids used to joke that their that grandma moved into the White House, and my mom moves follows me. She has come to Yale as I moved, because she raised my older son, who was born in residency. I had um, the delivery and then kind of left to the hospital and never saw him for six years. And our kids have been incredibly resilient. We also know how what things are important to our kids, and we try to make sure we hit those major events. So family does should come first. Um, but it all, they also understand that we take care of patients and have departments. So 
they've understood and grown up living the lifestyle. And as I mentioned, my parents have been very supportive. I have a sibling, another, I have a younger sister who also is a surgeon and we've learned. And now I have friends who have lived this piece. So um, I think we also have that friendship circle. My last boss at Hopkins was one of the first female chairs in the country of surgery, and she had a seven-year-old when she came. So I watched her. So you also learn how other people do it. And I don't think there's one right way. You should never see that, that it's just raising kids is hard. Um, kids need parents, um, and everyone makes their own style and choices. Many people think, you know, they watch, I don't know, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, social media, and people see this perfection. Life is not perfect. Life is kind of messy. And you just have to embrace it and understand what your personal priorities are and of your kids. What surprised you about medical school or residency? I knew nothing about medical school. I knew I wanted to be a physician. Don't ask me why. Um, but as I mentioned, no one in my family was a physician, so I did not know much about medical school. Not knowing and not having decided you know, coming in, I want to be, I see students who come in telling me, I want to be a neurosurgeon. I'm like, be open um, and just be inquisitive because that, I think, was the best gift they gave me to think about things. So not having preset ideas allowed me to say, I want to be a surgeon. Was there a particular mentor or somebody who really encouraged you or guided you that you looked up to um, at any point so far? Oh, lots of people. You can't make this journey without people who support you. When I came to Duke as a medical student, I mentioned um, going into OBGYN and the chair of that department was a great human being, Dr. Hammond, um, who really supported women at a time. And this seems archaic now, but this is not that far away. The Duke didn't have women in surgical department of surgery. There were no women, zero. No women faculty, no women medical residents. So there was no role model to look to see you could do this. And it's hard when you don't see anyone who not only not looks like you, but it's not even your gender. Uh, but Dr. Hammond was really supportive. He was in OBGYN, but it was a surgical specialty. And there were a few women, some of my roommates became surgeons. So he gave us permission. It was really inspiring to be in this department and it was a fun residency. The residents were really awesome people who would just take us under their wings. So all of us said, we want to do this. Because often you make choices because you admire somebody. So we admired them. And then I went to the lab of a breast surgeon who then really encouraged me to say, you don't have to be an OBGYN, you could be a general surgeon and go through the uh, uh, a training where you can really do all, all types of cancer surgery. So those were there and then I came in residency and had more role models who then became famous people. So I think that continues that cycle. It's as you get further along, you don't have mentors who perhaps sit with you for hours at a time, but you get sponsors. People give you a lift. So this job, getting this job, was sponsors around the country who then said, you know, I am the 15th chair in a department that's 215 years old, the first female chair. There's only about nine, when I took the job, there were only 19 chairs of surgery. I think it was 18 or 19th ever in the country. So it's an incredibly small pool but people support you and put your name and encourage you. So always, there are so many people who I admire and respect, who've, and I'm grateful to them. And I say my job is to then make sure the next chairs and leaders come behind me. So it's, it's fun. I'm Nancy and Shipley. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. So the question is, what's the spark that made me want to be a physician? So the first time around when I was a pre-med in college and rapidly weeded out, that was not for the right reasons. Um, I graduated with a psych degree and worked in different fields. I worked in marketing and sales. I was in the snowboarding industry. I helped run a small business. I also dabbled a little bit in learning about acupuncture 
literature and traditional Chinese medicine. And while I found that really interesting and I feel like it definitely has a role in the care of the whole body, um, I realized that that was just one piece of the puzzle. And, and I definitely acknowledge the history behind Chinese medicine and acupuncture. And I, and, and I often talk to my patients about the important role, but it was around that time as I was learning about it that I kind of looped back around and realized, oh my gosh, I actually think I do really enjoy the sciences and I do really want to become a physician and that sort of drove me to consider medicine again the second time around and, and this time for the right reasons. So I had a little bit of an uphill battle applying to medical school. I was already four or five years out when I out of college when I decided to apply and I graduated from college with a 2.99999 which fortunately rounds up to a 3.0 but certainly that alone is not competitive enough to get into medical school so I knew that I had to bolster my application by not only getting a really good score on the MCAT so I studied hard for that and um, I also, while working full time, went to, I think it was four different colleges through their extension programs and night classes um, to do the post-baccalaureate classes, to do all my prereqs, some of which, because I had been out of college for so long, were no longer valid, so I had to redo them. Um, but with my renewed um, vigor and motivation in getting good grades and getting into medical school, I really applied myself this time, which I think was the problem uh, in college. I didn't actually apply myself. Uh, and, I, and I got a really good GPA in all of my post-baccalaureate classes. I think it was 4.0 or pretty, pretty darn close. And I think that together with a good MCAT score um, and good interviews helped me get into medical school. As a woman in orthopedics and as a woman applying to orthopedics, there were really probably more people than not that told me, you can't do this or you shouldn't do this. And the reasons are pretty ridiculous in my opinion. I've had people say, you'll never find a husband. Not true, found one. <laughs> <laughs> he found me. Um, you won't be able to be a good mom and I'd like to think that I am. I have a son who's seven now and he's thriving and doing great. Um, that you won't be strong enough. Also not true. And that it's just too challenging to get in. It's, it's too competitive. You'll never get in. And uh, fortunately, I'm stubborn, and along the way, um, with the help of these mentors, I've, I've kind of confronted the naysayers and said, well, you know, I'm going to prove you wrong. So it's a little bit unique being a woman in medicine and, and maybe even more unique being a woman in orthopedic surgery because our numbers are so low. Uh, the most recent data that I've seen is that there are only about 6% women in orthopedic surgery. So what happens in the hospital sometimes is a case of mistaken identity. I could have a white coat on, I could have my name and the initials MD emblazoned after it and it wouldn't matter. I have been mistaken for dietary, for nursing, for um, the uh, x-ray tech, for housekeeping. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's uh, interesting and, and I'm not saying that there is anything negative or bad about any other profession or any other career. It's, it's more that the idea of a woman being the surgeon is still so foreign for some people that it's, it's not their first thought. Whereas if you see somebody who's male walking in with scrubs and a white coat, it's almost automatically assumed. And so I, I think that that is one of the unique challenges being female in a field where you're underrepresented. And I, I think that we still have a long way to go. And I think that these biases are sometimes just unconscious. Um, and, you know, even I myself am, it can be guilty of them. And I think that there is a lot of greater societal 
change and kind of retraining of how we think of women and their careers and women in medicine um, before we'll see a shift in that. My name is Yvette Martas and I am an obstetrician gynecologist at the Mansfield OBGYN Associates practice here in Connecticut. As a child, I used to go visit people in the hospital. Um, I accompanied my parents or uncle or aunt to a doctor in a hospital setting and there was something about the smell of the place. It just fascinated me and I was always fascinated by the human body. I watched every single program I could uh, on TV at the time, I'm talking about now the late 60s early 70s and I was just fascinated by the disease process um, but interestingly I never thought I could do it because uh, I never saw anyone that looked like me and there were usually white males that portrayed the physician um, but I enjoyed the fact that they solved the problem for the family and um, they also recognized the diseases and and solved those problems so there was something about that uh, that I felt pulled into. I also had a paternal grandmother who in our current language was an herbalist um, and she, people would come to her to be cured of whatever was ailing them and she would tell me these stories and I felt that that was something so interesting to do and to help people. Um, so I think that's what it was, but it, it was deep inside. Um, it's a calling for me. It's not just a job. When I graduated from high school, I was accepted to uh, Yale University, which is where I did my undergraduate. First time for a very typical Latina, first time away from home, um, first time for college, for the family, um, first of everything and I was overwhelmed. Um, I didn't really have a lot of uh, mentors that I could turn to to ask what would the experiences be like, well, how to study. Um, so I found that whatever my dreams might have been, once I saw what was required of the pre-med student, I didn't think I had it in me uh, to do it at that time because it would not allow me to really take advantage of the college experience, particularly Yale with its enormous uh, opportunity for travel and education. So I put it off and I thought at the time, well, you know, I'll be a lawyer, you know. Um, but I graduated. Uh, during my four years, by the way, I did go to Columbia, South America as a third year student and um, I took a semester there and I realized how amazing it is to be in other places and see how other people live. And I was still thinking that I would become a physician, but I just didn't know how. Um, then I spent a second semester in Puerto Rico looking for my own roots and still it was in the background. Um, when I graduated, I went on a, um, a job interview completely unrelated to health, just a job because I needed to get something together. Um, and I passed what I know now to have been Mount Sinai and some medical students that passed by. And I just said, wow, we've had you never even tried. And at that point I was like, hmm, gotta do it. So little by little, I did my uh, pre-med courses while working full time uh, for the Health and Hospitals Corporation. And I did it at night, it took me four years. I met my husband at the time as well so there was an, a plus there um, took the MCATs got into several medical schools chose Albert Einstein because it had a larger stu student body of mature adults who were choosing medicine as a, a second career um, and here I am I had a very uncomfortable uh, feeling with one of the professors um, who was teaching me histology and um, he made a pass at me and I had no idea what to do um, and I stopped going to that class 
it was really, really hard. Um, so at the time, not knowing what to do and how to describe what was happening was a big issue for me. Now we understand and we have a vocabulary for that, that sexual harassment, uh, but I didn't understand that then. In my third year uh, on the wards during medicine, um, there were four of us, three, uh, three guys and myself um, in this particular group of, in the rotation. Um, and one was a very talented African-American male, um, but I knew I was equally as smart as he. And I was pulled aside by my attending and he told me, you're both honor students. However, I'm I only give out one honor in each rotation and I'm going to give him the honor and you'll get high pass because he's going to, these are his words, he's a man and he's gonna have to take care of a family and he will, he needs to have all these higher grades in order to achieve his goals. I was speechless. I also didn't have the vocabulary to say something other than, that's not fair, um, which I didn't say because I didn't feel I could. Uh, being the only uh, Puerto Rican and Latina at the time of the program, um, you're aware of the biases um, and you will feel very powerless um, to respond to some of the racism um, and biases that are experienced by your patients. You can model, but because it's such a hierarchical uh, relationship, first year as an intern, then second and third in chief, uh, then your attendings, um, that was a real hard time for me. Um, but I felt, and this is why I stayed at NYU for my after residency, was I thought that the best way was to model. Uh, and be an attending that could be seen taking care of patients the way I thought they should be cared for, particularly the Spanish-speaking population. It's a big systemic problem with healthcare in general. Um, I think our philosophy is changing very, very slowly in that we do feel that healthcare, good healthcare should be accessible to everyone. At least we're having the discussion. But I do believe that there's a lot of work for us to be doing regarding cultural sensitivity and not just for Latinx, African Americans as well. African American women have the highest maternal mortality in this country and that is to truly through racism. But like we're doing right now, I think this is part of it, encouraging young women, uh, young people in general, people of color to consider some aspect of healthcare as a career. I think knowing yourself is really important. That way you know what it is that you want. Um, you know, people talk about, oh, pick, pick something where you're fine with the bread and butter. But I think it has to do with what do you want out of medicine? Do you want your patients to love you? Do you want to save lives? Um, do you like to do an operation so you can have immediate turnaround and see somebody better? I think those are how you decide. Do you like small talk? Do you want to BS with your patients for, you know, a 40 minute visit? I think knowing who you are and what your strengths are, playing off of that is important. Not just because you love the idea of, you know, the kidneys or something like that. It, it's important, you know, to know where the opportunities are for you to grow. Um, because when you find where you're well suited, that's sustainable for a career. A couple pieces of advice that I would like to share with young women who are interested in medicine would be to really identify what your passions are. Figure out what gives you joy in your career. Try to step back and look at the big picture and to sometimes not listen 
to what people are telling you because there are always going to be folks out there that are going to say, oh, it's too hard or it's not right for you or you can't do this and, and you have to have that strong inner drive. I think we need more women in medicine, period. <laughs> um, more women in surgery and also a more uh, women of color minorities across the board, not just women of color, but minorities across the board that are appropriately represented uh, throughout the medical profession. It doesn't matter if it takes you six years or eight years or ten years. Like in, in the course of a whole career, um, it may seem so important at the time, um, but if you're going to be in practice, you know, in the end for a career for, for 40 years, so if you took two extra years to get there because you decided to take a semester abroad and, you know, delay your graduation, that's a great thing. That's an experience you may not have ever had. So I think uh, I would have told myself as an undergraduate student, really not a whole lot different. Uh, I, I don't have a whole lot of regrets about how I went about it because uh, maybe I would have told myself not to worry so much about having it all figured out right then and there. Uh, sometimes that happens for folks at a young age, sometimes it happens a little bit later and I've always thought of myself as a late bloomer and I think had I known back then that I would still be an orthopedic surgeon now, I think I would have worried a lot less about not having it all figured out right then and there. Know who you are, know what you want to do, have a vision, um, it's very feasible. When I started my journey, I didn't think that I would make it to the end. And there were so many obstacles along the way. Uh, but try to think of those obstacles as challenges that you can grow from. Um, and that's essentially how I approach it. And nobody's born knowing everything and knowing how to do everything. It's a learning process. And it takes courage, it takes fortitude uh, to keep pushing forward. Never give up. Every single person that I've met that has found success, they always have stories of challenges along the way. It's not an easy path. But it's on those difficult days that I think you're able to dig the deepest and find that strength to just keep pushing forward, keep on the way. Maintain curiosity about life, um, be open to new ideas. And what I tell myself, and I tell have integrity in your life hold those moral values and the rest you know all of your smart people and you'll figure it out i would say to the young women who are watching this that if they have any inclination to do something difficult that is beyond their grasp that they should just go for it because they should do it and the only way you'll know that you can't achieve it is if you've tried and I would not allow myself to give in to the fear of failure because I have failed. I have failed exams, I have failed at many things in life, but you learn from it and there's nothing perfect in life other than your approach to trying to be a good, loving human being. Um, we all have gifts and we should not let them get stale. Um, so I would say you have what it takes to be whatever it is that you want to be and if you want to be a physician and care for women, there's nothing greater.